kitchen timer and open that up. Cool. So again, hopefully everyone's layout looks similar to this. If it doesn't, if it's not a big deal, let me know. It's probably like a Windows thing. So I guess maybe here we could also do here reset essentials maybe. And now maybe this should be the same for everybody. Okay, sorry. Okay, so um, show of hands, how many of you used Photoshop before? Okay, that's pretty much everybody. Uh, how many of you are comfortable in Photoshop? A couple of you. Okay, just like some Photoshop basics maybe then. Again, feel free, like I always have trouble gauging. Like I take things for granted. Sometimes I'm like maybe too obvious, but may, I, 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 I tend to just like share everything. And if it feels boring or like you all know it, feel free to give me feedback and say, oh, let's move on. I'm okay, I mean, my feelings won't be hurt. Um, so down here you have the layers tab. This is probably one of the most powerful things of Photoshop. Um, there's some icons on the bottom. Um, unfortunately, my recording icon is kind of in the way here. So you can like drag these out. Sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll like, uh, I guess, no, that's not true. I do leave my layers down here. Um, you know, you can always rearrange your work group as you see fit, or your workspace as you see fit. Like this, like learn libraries adjustment. I feel like I don't really use this. So like you can always like drag this up. The layers tab is really what's what's key here. And there's this little icon down here. Whoops, didn't mean to do that. Okay. <laughs> There's this little icon down here that looks like a page that creates a new layer. Again, it's unfortunately blocked by my, I'm gonna drag my layers tab out just a bit. It's this icon right here. If you click on that, it creates a new layer. And layers are like pages of pieces of paper that you're layering on top of each other. The thing is though, is you can see through the layers unless you like completely you know, for example, if I take this paint bucket tool and drop it on this layer, now I have a white page piece of paper overneath, over the background image that we opened up and scanned in. Um, you'll notice this background image has a lock on it. That's because this is like a JPEG that we opened. It just kind of comes in as it is. If you double click on this, it should unlock it or it brings up this thing that says layer zero. You can click OK. And now you can edit this. Um, so the layer tool is, is incredibly useful for like adding things to an image where maybe like, you know, for example, um, you know, let's say you wanted, this is not a good example, but if you wanted to like shade on something digitally, you might have it on a different layer. If you don't like it, you can turn it off, right? That would be one reason to use a layer. Um, holding Alt or I believe Option on a Mac and dragging copies a layer in your layer tool. So that's useful if you like I recommend that, especially if you're doing something like this where you're modifying stuff. That way, if you copy it and you make a mistake or you do something you know, a little bit different, um, you always have the original to go back and revert to. Um, so that's the Layers tab. Uh, there's other settings like the opacity of like how, how visible do you want the layer to be. That can be useful for blending purposes. Um, speaking about blending, there's all these different options here. We can talk about what some of them do. I guess, why not right now? Um, it's really going to frustrate me that I'm just going to leave my layers tab like just a little bit above this here. Um, so for example, right, I gave this rendering example here. Unfortunately, so the way that layers work is whatever is above obscures whatever is below. So you can see these like gray shadows are obscuring my line work. You could, I could change the opacity of the gray to make my line work come through, or I could change the blend mode. So for example, I could take this gray, drag it underneath here. Um, obviously it disappears because this has a white background. But here if I take this and change the blend mode, mode from normal to multiply, um, anything that's white kind of acts as a transparency. Um, this is, I guess, slightly more advanced stuff. I'm just trying to like give you just an overview. Uh, multiply is something I use on blend modes a lot. Again, it's just a way to make white things be uh, transparent. So now I have like, 
That's a very basic explanation of it. Um, so now I have my shading underneath of my scanned line work. Um, but really, the goal today was to show you all how you might scan stuff. Yeah. Uh, I set the actual scan itself to multiply. Uh, the goal today, though, is to show you all how to, if you have a drawing where maybe it's like in the wrong place, or you want to clean it up, or you want to play with your layout, what, how you can use Photoshop to do that. Um, which I'll get, I guess, I'll get to in a minute. Just to finish my tour of Photoshop, on the left here are all the tools that you can use to modify your drawing, and we'll, we'll get into some of these. Um, just know that like clicking and holding on any of these will show up more options. Um, you cannot see my toolbar for some reason. That's a good point. Uh, so I will do this as a quick workaround. There we go. Um, clicking, thank you for that. If, if any time you can't see something, please let me know. Uh, clicking and holding on, on this toolbar will show multiple tools. And again, we can talk about how we might use some of these. Um, I guess as a really quick rundown, this is the move tool. These are any of these like dots. <clears throat> Dash lines are selection tools. Uh, they're also referred to as marquees. Um, so different shape marquees. This is a different way to select by creating your own custom tool. This is yet another way to select with the magic wand tool. So for example, this one looks like you know, you click in a white space and it clicks all of it, selects all of the white space. This is cropping. This is image selection. This is a patch tool for like patching blotches. Paintbrush, used for drawing. Uh, stamp tool, you can set a target. So this is good for copying part of an image. Again, more for photo editing, really. Um, I don't use this one, history brush tool. So <laughs> I don't know about that one. Uh, it's a very deep program. There's many ways to do things. Uh, here's an eraser tool, as described, erases things. Um, paint bucket drops layers of color. In here is also the gradient tool. Blur tool and smudge is kind of fun. It just kind of like smears things. Um, so if I want to just like ruin this drawing, I don't know if this will work. It's thinking, it's struggling. Oh, on my drawing down here. Oh, that was just that was the paintbrush tool as like a quick example early on. Don't worry, you don't you all don't have that. So okay, the smudge tool you can see it takes a little bit of calculation, but it's kind of fun. You see what it's doing, right? It's like melting my my beautiful sketch. Sorry, guys. Um, below that is dodge and burn. It's kind of an old photo. Anyone who's taken photography or maybe you're in it now. Uh, dodging and burning is as you develop an image, it either makes it darker or lighter. Underneath that is the pen tool, which works very similar to Illustrator type tool for making te typing text. Um, shape tool for just like dragging shapes. Um, these are other selection tools. This like little arrow, I believe, is related to the pen tool. And zoom, here's where you set colors. And now I'm going to regret having smudged this because my computer just needs to think forever. Um, so when it comes to Photoshop, my recommendation for all of you is to only use it if you absolutely need to. I want to show you that so that you have the ability to use it if you want to. Um, but the goal would be, as you make your sketches, Photoshop can be used to like rearrange your layout. Okay. So in this instance, uh, what do we notice about this image that we've opened up that is not ideal for Project 3? Yeah, it fills up the middle page. And while that's not bad because you want your drawings to be nice, big, and center, um, why don't we want it big and center for Project 3? Yeah, you need orthographics, right? We need to leave space. All right, I'm about to be completely fed up with this smudge tool. It's still smudging. <laughs> I'm trying to hit escape. It's all right. Yeah, so you might want to like move it off to the side. Um, my other advice, there you go, it's gay, oh no. Yay, it stopped, kind of. Don't use the smudge tool. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, don't, don't be impatient with the smudge tool. Um, yeah, you might, 
so, so my advice with Photoshop is to only bring it in at the line work stage. My reasoning for that is if you bring it in when it's shaded, when you print it back out, the shading, like prints tend to print a bit darker, then you have like printer ink as opposed to marker ink. So if you have, like again, if you think about that consistency layout, it'll be very, it, it'll be clear that it's printed. I mean, I guess, take that with a grain of salt, but it's better to be consistent. And I, I imagine that you'll have a mix of analog, how do I put this? I prefer that you have analog marker rendering or analog pencil rendering. Um, for sure, if you shade with pencil and then print it out, that shaded pencil is going to look a bit funny. Um, cool, I'm going to delete this. This is why it's good to make copies. So does that make sense? So please, my rule for my class is to only scan in line work. If you absolutely need to scan in something with ink, I don't know, talk to me, but I prefer not. Um, <clears throat> I forgot a major component of Photoshop. It's right here. It's called the history. Um, it's kind of like an infinite undo. You can change the length of your history. The longer it is, the slower your program runs. The shorter it is, the less things you can roll back. I refuse to go back beyond my smudge tool because I don't want to hang up my computer again. But for example, you know, you make something, you're like, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. You can just roll back into history. Right, so as every time I do a brush tool, the history grows. Um, in Photoshop, if you hit Control-Z, it only goes back one step. So does and redoes. If you hit uh, Control-Shift-Z, Control-Alt-Z, Control-Alt-Z goes back multiple times. Okay, so I would say those are the most important things in Photoshop to know. The layers, the history, and the tools here. There's like a couple more things up here at the top, but you don't need to worry about that too much. Often here, these are where the settings for the tools are. Okay, so this is, that's just an overview of Photoshop. Any questions on that? <clears throat> so let's build on that conversation I started to have as my computer was, was going on the smudge train. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna show you all how to you know, clean the sketch up and move it to where we want it. So, um, first off, I do recommend, if you haven't done it yet, double clicking on your background layer. Uh, and if it said background and unlocking it, clicking layer zero, and then just dragging a copy of it. This way, if, if there's a, you know, if you need to like go back and, and edit the original, you can if you make a mistake. Um, I forgot to mention, I apologize that on the layer tool here, uh, the eyeball means whether it's visible or not visible. So if you click the eyeball, it turns off the layer. Um, also, for what it's worth, this checkered board means transparency. That's how Photoshop denotes transparent. Okay, so we've made a copy of our layer. We now wanna shrink this and move it over, but before we wanna do that, we wanna clean it up. I don't know, you'll notice my scanner at home is like dirty. There's like ink on it from scanning wet drawings and on what have you. Um, you can see like a bit of the edge of the paper here. So the way that I like to edit images is um, the shortcut is control L, but it's under here, it's under image adjustments levels. It's basically a fancy uh, contrast setting uh, that has, gives you a little bit more control. Um, and there's different ways to use it. So the, mo the, the way that I basically use it is there's sliders here there's a dark slider, so if I drag, you know, if you want to mess with it and drag the dark slider all the way up, you can see what happens. Um, on the right side, you have the white slider. If you drag it all the way to the left, you can see what happens. It blows it out. And really, if you drag the left, the dark to the right a bit and the light to the left a bit, you can kind of find a happy medium where you start to blow out the paper and any smudges that you have. Unfortunately, it's kind of getting rid of my, or maybe fortunately, depending on your goal, it's getting rid of my underlay lines. So you can see kind of these, hopefully you can see on your screen, these like set up bounding box sketch I did. Um, by dragging the white to the left a little bit, it starts to like obscure some of those lighter line weights. So that's a really quick way to clean up a sketch. The uh, setting in the middle, you can kind of lean it one way or the other and it's kind of a final adjustment. I would start with the edges and then, and then tweak the middle as you see fit. 
Um, but that's often what I do when I start to clean up a sketch is, is to go with that. Um, now again, you'll notice like some of these marks here, like you could, if you want to be incredibly like uh, clean about this, is I like to use this polygonal lasso tool. I always have trouble saying the word polygonal. It's like I have a bunch of cotton in my mouth. Um, if you don't see this, if you, if you hold click the third tool option down, it probably defaults to the lasso tool is maybe what you see. But I like this one, the polygonal lasso tool. And the way this works is, this is often what I use for selecting, um, is you click and you make lines, right? And that's how you make your selection. Once again, I take certain things for granted and I breeze over it. It's useful to know some hotkeys for moving and working around your page. Space bar brings up the hand, and if you're way zoomed in, it can move your drawing around. So that's space bar. Space bar plus control option is zoom out. Space bar plus control is zoom in. These are the most common hotkeys that I use with Photoshop. It helps with your work your workflow. Yeah, absolutely happy to do that. So when it comes to Photoshop workflow and navigating around your image is important. So the hotkeys that I use the most are the navigation hotkeys. Once again, they are spacebar brings up the hand, which allows you to drag your workpiece around. So spacebar and click is what a left click allows me to do this. Spacebar plus control, which I think is the same on a Mac, is zoom. Spacebar plus control plus alt on a PC or spacebar plus control plus option on a Mac is zoom out. Uh, I think also if you do like, and again, you have to click, left mouse click for each zoom in or zoom out step. I believe if you do spacebar control, you can click drag. Nope. Click drag zooms way in real fast. I thought, yeah, never mind. So if you click drag, it's just like, Way zoom in, way zoom out. I'll make y'all motion sick. Uh, drag, yeah, yeah, you get it. Cool, does everyone? So sorry, I forgot to mention that because I I just do it without thinking. Um, so again, we talked about levels, setting the page, getting the page behind. That also again, that levels gets rid of, rid of smudges, but also like all these like little doodads here. There's different ways to get rid of them. Uh, but I would say the quickest way to do that is I would take this polygonal lasso tool, select around your image. So again, I just do you just do this by clicking around the image. So again, if you all want to do this with me, it doesn't have to be tight. It can be kind of loose like this. And whenever you're done, you can either go back to the start. And if you, I don't know if you all can see this, it's incredibly small. I probably can't. Um, Maybe you can see it on your own screen. When you get back to your start, look for a little circle by this icon. Um, and that means it's completing the selection. The other way to complete the selection quickly is to just hold control. And wherever you are, it will draw a straight line to the start of your selection tool. And that's another quick way to complete it. Uh, but by doing this, what it does is it now shows us this little marching dotted lines around our image. Maybe a lot of you know this already or not. I've heard this referred to as ants. Um, this is showing what's selected. Um, sometimes if you hit, yeah, it doesn't matter. So this you could like copy and paste and that way it would get rid of all the stuff in the background. One thing I might suggest is to go up here to the selection uh, drop down menu and go to modify and select feather. And what this does is it makes the edge be a soft edge. It gives it a bit of a blur to it. Um, so if I select feather, you know, it, this is how many pixels do you want it blurred? I would pick something like five. And it just gives it, I'll show you what that does um, here. So now if I hit control C, control C is in copy, or you could go edit copy, and then edit paste. And now if you turn off the layer we copied from, you'll notice now we have our clock and there's no smudges, nothing around it because we selected around it. Um, if I zoom way in on this edge, this is what the feathered effect looks like. Hopefully you can see this. It, it kind of, 
it goes from a nice gradient of a pure white to the transparent. If you didn't feather, that'd be a sharp edge. And there's a chance that if you didn't set your levels properly, um, that might show up in your print as like a hard edge, right? You want this to look, you want this to be white. Um, if you're worried about setting your levels properly, if you hit control L to bring up levels, that's the quick way to do it. If you take the white eyedropper here and click on whatever piece of paper background you have, that's a quick way to make sure that your paper is going to print as pure white and you're not going to have any like weird darkness around your image. Now be aware, by me allowing you to use Photoshop, if I notice any like bad Photoshop usage. So here, let me give you an example. If you print this out, let's see if I can make this work. I mean, this is maybe too obvious, but here, let's do this. Ignore what I'm doing, I'm just trying to make the white not white, for an example. If I see something like this around your line work, I'm going to take off like major points, okay? Like me giving you, right, with great power comes great responsibility. Uncle Ben, Spider-Man, anyone? Um, Photoshop is a very powerful tool, okay? So please use it responsibly. Uh, don't, um, you know, double check your work. Don't let it be sloppy. This obviously, I think we can all agree, this wouldn't look good if you did this. So, so just... Again, that's where, here I can show you this again. If you hit Control L, if you take this white eyedropper tool and just drop it on your paper, it makes it white, blends it out. It'll make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, okay, I'm gonna roll back to where I was before. Okay, so now, does everyone have this selected out? Any questions so far? Am I going like too boring, too slow, or just right? Cool, just right, I like it. Um, okay, so now that this is separated, obviously now we can, guess what? We can drag it around. So before when we had our drawing in the middle, and that's, sorry, that's using this tool up here, the move tool, it's also V. It looks like this plus with arrows on it. Um, I would recommend like, you know, dragging this off to the side. Things I wouldn't recommend, I'm gonna let, you know, they exist. Here's the eraser tool, right? If you have a line you're not happy with, you could conceivably erase it. I would not recommend that. It's it's not worth your time. Um, unless it's something like totally horrendous, don't do it. I I don't know. Have I taken off points for like? I guess I probably have. <laughs> Sorry. Um, there are definitely sometimes lines that shouldn't be there, but. Unless it's like all over your drawings, it's not going to kill your grade. It's not worth the time, in my opinion. Uh, especially by me, you know, by introducing underlays. Um, you know, uh, introducing underlays. You shouldn't have lines. Your lines should be where they belong, right? Um, I guess sometimes, yeah, you, you trace a line that shouldn't be there. In that case, if you want to erase it, go for it. Um, I guess while we're talking about the eraser tool, up here you have your brush settings. So like, here, let me see how clear I can make this. Let me just do this real quick. So here's the, the drawing tool. If I give a nice like blanket red area. So the brackets, the square bracket and right bracket is what allows me to make this bigger and smaller really quickly. Holding shift in those brackets changes the hard edge of this. So what I was showing you with the eraser here is the hardness. It's in this setting up here. You can set it the same way with the bracket. So right now it's a soft setting. So if I erase on this red, it gives us like, again, kind of this like feathered edge. If I change that hardness to be very hard, 100%, and I erase, it gives us a hard edge. So again, this is the difference. Feathered, hard, soft, hard. So this is the same as like setting that feather tool on our selection. Um, when it comes to erasing things, I also recommend using something kind of either in the middle or soft. Um, if you're erasing lines, again, I recommend you not do it, but if you want to do it, a softer eraser will help blend that erase and not make it look hard and sharp. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, please.
Yeah, absolutely. The goal here, so okay, the question is, is it okay to use a different program, editing program, if you're familiar with it? The answer is yes. Uh, when it comes to grading, I'm just looking for like, you know, again, same things. Make sure that for some reason it doesn't print dark or it doesn't, weird things don't happen. Um, it doesn't look pixelated. That's another very important thing, actually. Um, that's something I will take off points for. So when you scan this image, you know, we can all do this now. So everyone go to image and go to image size. Look here where it says resolution. This is 200 pixels per inch. That is probably the smallest you want to go at eight and a half by 11. Sometimes the default is 72 pixels per inch. That's for screens, that's for the internet. Um, often that's the default scan setting. Default, default, default scan setting. Um, when you print, if you print at 72 pixels per inch, that's when you get like little little cubes that make up your drawing. It looks pixelated. I think you're all familiar with that. Uh, so when you scan, just try and see if you can set your scan settings, find where it is, set it to 200 or 300 pixels per inch, okay? You can never scale up. If it scans in at 72 and you change, if I change the setting right now to 600 pixels per inch, it'll kind of work, but it, it, it does it, it doesn't. Photoshop has gotten incredibly smart where it can kind of make up the mi missing pixels. Um, so I guess it's better than nothing, but don't do it. It's always better to go smaller, not bigger, okay? Um, so yeah, the short answer is you can use a different program because all that we're learning to do today, the really the end result that we're looking for is how to take this image, clean up any like messiness in terms of smudges or lines or scan stuff, and getting it into a new position from the center off to the side. So if you can do that in a different program, I'm not gonna know what program to use. I'm just gonna be looking for things like pixelate, pixelation or something dark. Good question. Okay, is everyone still with me? Does all make sense still? So, Actually, back to this image settings. You, you want to make sure you are eight and a half by eleven because that's what you're printing at, right? So I, I mean, I provided this image. I made sure it was eight and a half by eleven. But sometimes your scanner might scan at a larger size. Um, so that's where you might want to use the crop tool, or you could go to image canvas size, and this is where you would set eight and a half by eleven. So let's just say for some reason I scanned it eleven by seventeen right now. You don't need to do this. Um, but let's say your image comes in really big, so you go to image, canvas size. Here you would type in 11 inches wide by eight and a half inches tall. You'll notice that these arrows change. So the default is that it, it, it shrinks about the center, which is fine, but just so you know, you can click in any of these boxes and this, this will change the direction that it shrinks in. But again, when in doubt, just click in the middle. And what canvas size does is it crops it. It'll say, hey, we're cutting away the image. You say, yep, go ahead. I know you're doing that. Um, canvas size is good for changing the size of the paper. The reason you don't do it in image size is because this will scale everything as it changes it. So one of it, it canvas size cuts the paper, image size scales the paper. It stretches it or shrinks it. So when it comes to getting an eight and a half by 11, use canvas size. Okay, any questions on any of that? Okay, we have chopped this out. We can now drag it around where we want it. Last but not least is the transform tool. Edit, transform, scale. I believe it's also under control T for control transform. Um, but again, in case you missed it, edit, transform, scale. Um, and it brings up these, this box around here. So you don't want to just go crazy, right? Because that's what happens, your proportion changes. And you don't want to do that because you set it up with your underlay. Um, you want to hold down shift. And by holding down shift, it constrains your proportions. It did? Oh. Thank you for that. I am not aware of that. Um... Do you know what constrains it by any chance? Oh, you don't have to click anything now. It's the opposite. That's brilliant. I love that. Um, then it's annoying. Okay. 
Is there is a chance? Am I with the latest Photoshop right now? You know what? I'm not going to go into this now. Thank you for that. That's great to know. Um, so yeah, if you go to Control-T and you're on a Mac, your life is made easier. If you're on a PC or you don't have the latest version of Photoshop, you have to hold Shift. Um, yeah, but just make sure you scale in the right constraint. So chances are you could use this to scale bigger if you wanted, but I strongly recommend you don't uh, for the reason that it might get pixelated and for the reason that you're drawing gets more messy the bigger you make it. It's always better to draw big and scale small. In this instance, we want to make sure there's enough room for our orthographic. So we want to scale this just a little bit smaller. Again, my advice is to go like about a third of the page, maybe like two fifths. But you know, you can cite the center. You could, if you really wanted, go to like view and show rulers. And if you drag this back corner to here, it zeroes it. And if we know it's 8.5 by 11, whoops, didn't mean to do that. You can click in this ruler section and drag, and it brings a ruler up. And if you go to like 5.5, I believe if you hold shift, it snaps it. Um, this is now the center, the halfway of our page. So yeah, you want your like 3D view to be about half the page, I guess, and the other half to be the orthographic, depending on how much space you need for it. It's going to change per object. But you want your orthographics nice and big. Any questions on any of this? Um, for what it's worth, so one thing I might recommend is you create a new layer here underneath your other layer if you've done what I have. You can click on this box down here and go to the top left to get a pure white. And then just get the paint bucket tool and drop a white background behind this just so you can see what the page looks like. Hopefully this will catch any like color discrepancy in here and avoid that from happening. Um, but now you have a visualization of what your page looked like. If I just drag this layer to the top, we can see where we went from, from here to here. Uh, this is, it's hard to see, but on my computer screen, this is a little bit darker. Now this is pure white. We cleaned away some of these nasties. <laughs> here, I, um, so to make the white background, I created a new layer. That was my first step. I made sure it's underneath my drag layer here. I went down here to my color selector, these two boxes. The top left one is the, the main color that you're going to color with. You click on that and you drag it to the top left to get white. Or you can like check your settings here. These are all at 255 if you're an RGB. Click OK. Then go here to your paint bucket tool. If you don't see the paint bucket, hold down underneath the eraser. And you want paint bucket tool. And then making sure you're on this new layer, you just click anywhere inside of it. If for some reason your icons are looking different than mine, it's probably because you have caps lock on. If you hit caps lock, it gives you like a crosshair, which is a little bit more precise. It shows you exactly where your dot is. Hitting caps lock gives you the icon, the visual of what you have. Did that answer your question again? Again, I, you know, this is not necessary. It's just, it's just a way to check and make sure that your image, it helps you visualize the piece of paper better. All right, so that's literally like this. I believe this gives you all the ammunition that you need to scan an image in, correct it, move it if you need to change the layout. Uh, again, I just strongly, strongly recommend that you only do this for line work. Um, if you have to do it for ink, something that's already been colored in, please talk to me first. If you didn't talk to me and you do it, I reserve the right to remove points, okay? <clears throat> um, cool. Any questions on this?